exactly what's going to happen, what they should do. So this is after 2017, and we're going to go ahead and get started. In the seminar, we're going to talk about how you prepare for the next life, how you can help yourself and your ancestors and other people. This seminar will be available in the cloud afterwards, and uh, there'll be a link available so that the people that paid for it will be able to go to it and listen to it and um, watch it again. This seminar is a little bit different than the one we did in New Orleans, so you want to pay close attention, take very good notes, and for those people that have questions and stuff, well, we'll be able to answer some of them, but not all of them. We also have a sheet full of questions that people have, <coughs> and Crystal made a very cute question. She had four question, questions she wanted to ask, so we'll just have to see. I doubt we'll be able to get to all of those, Crystal. So the first question that comes up and that everybody has is what happens, what really happens in the afterlife? And uh, Master, how would you know this unless you had passed? Well, I remember a large number of my past lives. I also remember a large number of my past death experiences. And in this lifetime, I have gone to a number of past life situations uh, and experiences with a number of my clients and friends and family that have died. I had visited a number of the higher worlds. I've also visited a number of the lower worlds. I've visited hell, I've visited heaven, um, the in-between worlds, and I know quite a bit about the death experience. I've also visited a lot of people shortly after their deaths. I've visited them in their graves. I've talked with people, um, in their new life experiences. So I have quite a lot of experience in this area. On this planet, death is considered to be a leading cause of spiritual disturbances. Now, you might say, well, isn't that true on all planets? Actually, it is not. Death does not occur on all planets. There are some planets where death has been cured as a cause of suffering. In other words, in some planets, everybody that lives there is an immortal. So the causes of death and the problem of death is not a pervasive problem everywhere in the universe. There are many planets in the galaxy where death doesn't exist at all. But let's stick with this planet. On this planet, 154,889 people die on the average every day, which means that about two people die on Earth every second of every day. That's a lot of people. Two people die every second. The causes of death on this planet, let's stick with the U.S. because that's where a lot of the people that are listening to this live. Um, in the year 1900, infectious disease was actually the main cause of death. Cancer was number two, heart disease was number three, cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, accidents, and uh, just frailty and age were the main causes of death. Those things have changed quite a lot now. Cancer and heart disease are now number one and number two causes of death. Cancer being number one, heart disease is now on number two cardiovascular disease, accidents, and old age, diabetes, all those who now have now gone down quite a lot as major causes of death. Over time, things that kill people in the last 110 years have changed quite a lot. Ten leading causes of death in the rest of the world, ischemic heart disease from coronary heart disease, coronary failure, that sort of thing, Strokes, um, they affect primarily the brain and the limbs. Uh, <clears throat> constructive pulmonary disease, uh, also lower respiratory infections, uh, pneumonia, bronchitis. Those are more, they're larger causes of death in other parts of the world than they are in the U.S., in part because we have better access to health care and better access to medicines in other parts of the world. HIV kills about a million and a half people a year. Diabetes. Uh, kills about a million and a half people a year. Accidents on the road, especially car accidents, kill about 1.3 million people a year. But the biggest cause of a disease that causes people to go into the next world continue to be ischemic heart disease and strokes. 
So most people listening to this, most people in the world are going to die of one of those top four things. And that's as of, as of the year 2012. But there is a strange fact. Not all humans die. Some humans are immortal. And many of the people that are immortal don't know that they're immortal. What is an immortal human? Well, let's look at it by the numbers. There are about 358,192 births every day. Two people die every second. There are about, about 358,192 births every day. That means every day, 358,000 people are born. But of these 358,000 people, 0.00003% of them are born immortal. Now, what do we mean by being born immortal? There are different types of immortality. On the average, that means that 10 people every day are born immortal. These 10 people can be born with different types of immortality, but 10 people every day are born immortal. All the people, all humans that are born in the world have the immortality gene, which means that all of us have the potential to be born immortal. So 99.9999% of humans are born with this gene and it's recessive and it's heavily repressed, which means that a lot of energy is put into stopping the gene from being manifested. A small, hum small percentage of humans are born partially immortal, which means that they can't be killed by disease or aging. They can be killed by a gunshot, you can cut their head off, they can die in a car accident, they can be drowned, but by normal disease, normal aging, like heart disease, strokes, uh, those sorts of things, kidney disease, diabetes, they're not going to get those. They will live as long as their body remains intact and nobody shoots them with a bullet or anything. They can die of a fatal injury. And these humans quickly learn to avoid danger and they are ex extremely risk averse. There are actually communities of humans around the world that have the immortality gene and they know that they have the immortality gene. And these humans, don't really like to fly. They don't like to drive fast cars. They kind of keep to themselves. When I say risk averse, they are extremely risk averse. And they don't like taking in any type of risk in order to be able to possibly hurt themselves. Partially immortal humans can live for thousands of years but most will eventually die of some sort of natural catastrophe, whether it be an earthquake, uh, war is considered to be a catastrophe, they can be drowned in great floods. Things happen on the earth and people unfortunately are not able to avoid all of the things that happen on earth. But there is an even smaller percentage of humans that are born fully immortal, which means that you can't kill them. They are fully immortal. They can't be killed by disease. They can't be killed by injury, natural for catastrophe. What happens then if they get drowned in a great flood? Well, they'll just stay there and float underwater until the water recedes and they'll get up and walk away. What happens if somebody um, buries them accidentally in a, in a flood or an earthquake? Well, they'll eventually wait until the soil recedes and they'll dig themselves out. They can't be killed. Their life force is a function of the fundamental forces of reality, of creation. So they're gonna stay around as long as reality stays around. And there are humans, uh, less than 1% of all the immortals are either, are, are fully immortal. Full, full immortality is a very rare gift for humans, but it does exist. I have met some full immortals and they know that they're fully immortal. They don't get sick. They don't age, though they will fake aging and they will fake illness. And when the time comes, they have to move usually every 50 to 60 years because people notice if you don't get old and if you don't get sick and if you don't get, if you don't get infirm. They recognize that something's going on with this person. So they have 
a number of different residences that they live in, and they have also these communities, these conclaves of immortal community, where they will go after what appears to be a normal lifetime. They'll stay there for a while, and then they will re-emerge back into society. Hey, this is a new person in the neighborhood. They will usually look the same for hundreds, if not thousands of years. They don't change very much, if at all. So what is the force that separates immortals from mortals? We're talking about the afterlife. We had to also mention the process of immortality in this whole uh, scheme of things of looking at, well, what is immortality and what is not immortality? What is the force that represses the immortality gene and causes humans to die? There's a name of this force. So let's take a quick look at it. And I see we have some questions. We're going to get to those in a moment. The force is called Triskagal. It's a cosmic force that acts through will and it causes a decline in the entropy or organization in matter. In other words, there's something that acts on our willpower that makes it so that we think about death as we get older or actually through the entirety of life. If you look at movies, if you look at television, if you read books, if you look at newspapers, magazines, you'll find that this force is often, well, let's just say it is often reinforced. If you turn on the television, you, if you look at most TV shows, you're gonna see somebody talk about death, you're gonna see a murder, you're gonna see a car accident, something where people can be injured or killed sometime in that hour. On the average, there are about seven murders or accidents that are potentially fatal, fatal on TV every hour. So you're going to see that a lot. You can read about it in books quite a lot. So this force is reinforced in our lives, in our society, quite a lot. True mortals and partial immortals have low degrees of this force, which means that they don't, they're not affected by the force of will that causes you to age, that causes you to feel sick and causes you to feel like, I've lived long enough, I think I should just go now. I used to work in a lot of nursing homes in Arizona. And one of the main complaints that older people had is that everybody I know is dead. Everybody I know is sick. All my children or, or grandchildren or some, most of my friends are gone. And so in a person's mind, after a while, they get the idea that it's time for them to go as well. So we'll go ahead and take a few questions. I see one from Jaya. How are you doing, Jaya? How are you doing, Jai? Your question is, do immortal parents have immortal children? Hmm. Well, the immortal gene, the immortality gene is a very weak, recessive gene. So it's very rare for immortal parents to have immortal children. It's going to be about one in eight of their children will have some degree of that immortal gene. Uh, see, so Di has four questions. Um, in the Dark Ages, why were immortal human beings killed? Well, it was only the partial immortal humans that was killed during that time period. You can't kill a fully immortal being, and that's why one of the reasons the church came up with such an elaborate means of killing people. You didn't have to put stones around a person and wait for them to drown in order to kill them. They did that to weed out partial immortality and other degrees of immortality. They recognized that some people, you couldn't just put them in water and expect them to drown. If you drowned in some of the tests, then you were considered to be blessed by God. If you didn't drown, they knew that you had something else going on with you. Last question from Jaya. Will the earth be expanded to accommodate for the increased immortality in the future? Excellent question. Immortality is a gene that is starting to spread. And the powers that be, the people on this world, are recognizing that there are going to be a number of people that, aren't, that just are not going to die. They're just not. Unfortunately, there are certain things that have been planned to help lower the population on this world. People are living longer. People are living healthier. So certain things that are going to happen on this world are designed to help take out some of those people that are unfortunately uh, living beyond their means. 
Okay, we'll take one more question, then we'll get back uh, to the seminar. Let's see. This is from Yolanda. What can you feel or see as you're going through the veil as you're dying? That is an excellent question. Well, what you see as you're going through the veil really depends on your consciousness. This is definitely a question that's worth answering. There are several things that you can see as you go through the veil. For people with the lowest level of consciousness that have the, the most negative mindset, that have not meditated, that have not worked on their consciousness, they may not see anything. They may see nothing at all. The next level of people are people that have some religious or spiritual affiliation. They may see a bright light. They may see a figure, a family member, a loved one coming through uh, to see them, to welcome them. They may also see a representative from their religion or spiritual affiliation. They may see a Jesus figure. They may see a Buddha figure. Some people who have highly evolved consciousness may be greeted by angels or higher beings who will carry them into a higher state of being. The people at the highest state of consciousness will see an entire world open up to them and their consciousness and their spiritual form will step through a portal. This is not common, but it happens at the highest level of consciousness and those people can travel directly from one world to the next with no intermediate judgment period, no intermediate purgatorial type state, no intermediate lower astral form. So we'll, we'll, that's enough questions for now. Let's move to the next slide. The only way to combat the negative effects of this force, Triskagal, is to elevate your consciousness and the force of will. In other words, there are certain things you, you can do to make yourself live longer. Your willpower can be strong enough such that your body will stop aging and will stop trying to kill you. But you have to do the right things. It is fashionable to be skeptical. It is fashionable to be negative. It is fashionable to say, as you get older, you're gonna die and get sick. But those are not fait accompli, which means that you don't have to do those things. There are alternatives. Now, since we did this uh, seminar, there's a book that we wrote called Ars Immortalis. Ars Immortalis is a series of exercises that will help a human being develop the right consciousness and develop the right will so that you can begin to combat this whole state of negative consciousness, skepticism and anxiety that tends to kill people. Ars Immortalis teaches you how to decode the immortal thoughts that you have so that they can begin to dominate your thoughts. It also helps open a key in your spiritual growth so that your body can begin to evolve in its ability to not kill itself. With the right attention and the right focus, using this particular tablet, we can help you tremendously. You can find it on our website at www.tybro.com. Look under Power Books and you'll see this beautiful cover called Ars Immortalis. It's one of our best sellers and also one of our most powerful books, Ars Immortalis. So, after. Let's look at the first minute of what happens in a person's life after they begin to leave this world. There is a pulse, a pulse that we have in the body called the life pulse, which causes the heart to beat and the blood to flow. When that life pulse leaves you, your heartbeat begins to weaken. And the heart doesn't stop all at one time. It weakens, and it can be a, a very thready, weak pulse right away that you can sense in a person. That person isn't quite gone yet. And in ancient times, sometimes people were buried just because their heartbeat got weak, but they weren't gone. If whatever was causing the heartbeat to weaken restores the heartbeat, that person will wake up. And unfortunately, there were remedies put in graveyards um, where a person could pull a certain cord from their casket and let people know that they were not dead. And that's where the term the graveyard shift came from. The third shift was a time of night where people used to start, stand watch over a graveyard 
and wait to see if people would pull that switch at night. And that was called graveyard shift work. EEG is the electroencephalogram. It's a type of electrical uh, device that is used to measure electrical activity in the brain. As the brain ages or dies, this activity changes. And at the moment of death, there is no electrical activity in the brain. It's like measuring the heartbeat for the brain. Obviously at death, the person stops breathing and eventually the breathing stops altogether. Ultimately, after the first minute, consciousness begins to separate from the body. This is when most people will see something akin to the afterlife experience. Not everybody sees the same thing as we said, but you will begin to see something. After the first minute, your heart pulse and your heartbeat will weaken. There may be still some weak EEG activity, but not a lot. Your breathing may still be present and it may weaken, but eventually the breathing stops and your consciousness separates from the body. In this slide, you see a representation of the different bodies that are present um, that we're gonna be talking about as you go through the death process. And unfortunately, most people, except for the small few that are immortal, are gonna go through this. We have a subtle body, which is composed of several parts. The supercausal body is a part of us that doesn't really die, but it incarnates every time we come into the world. It causes us to feel separate from God. The intellect or the causal body is a part of us that reasons and makes decisions. The soul never separates from God, but it only feels that it's separate because of the, the process called the ego. The mental body is where our feelings, emotions, and desires are held. We also have something called the vital body, which is where the life pulse is situated. It's where our life energy derives from. And the physical body is held together by the senses, touch, taste, smell, sound, and sight. All of these comprise who you are, who we are. Now, what happens next is largely dependent on the consciousness of the body and how well prepared you are for death. Most people don't do anything to prepare for death. They just try to avoid it as much as possible. But that first hour is the most critical time in your transition process. That's the time that you need to prepare for the most. Because in every lifetime, unless you're one of those true or partial immortals, you're going to go through this. But preparing for this, especially that first hour, is something that we need to do and we're going to talk about. True immortals who go through what looks like a death process, the body will simply reboot, which means that something may happen, somebody may try to kill them, but normally it would be a fatal strike, a fatal blow, like a gunshot or something like that, but their body will just reboot, it'll heal whatever the injury was, and they'll keep going. A partial immortal will appear just to die as in normal bodies, but if the injury is not fatal, not too severe, that body will reboot, heal, and they'll return to full function. If they have pneumonia, if, they, um, if, they get, if they're going to a situation where they look like they're drowning or some sort of injury, they're not gonna get an illness like a normal person. But if they do get something that appears to be a fatal injury, they'll just reboot, heal from it, and keep going. And true immortals and partial immortals, if the injuries are catastrophic in nature, and actually a partial immortals, the body will die, but not in a true immortal. This is only true for a partial immortal. Now, the consciousness of a true immortal and a partial immortal will remain bound to earth, which means that they're not going anywhere. Unless they learn spiritual techniques to evolve and grow, they're not going to go anywhere. They're not going to go to a higher world. They're not going to go to uh, one of the planes of reality that other people strive to go to. They're going to stay right here. In our book, Spiritus, we talked about spiritual atmospheres and different types of breathing that can help a person begin to evolve and grow in the spiritual process. These beings tend to learn about Spiritus and Spiritus type techniques, and that helps them escape perpetual existence on earth. They, they get something called immortality sickness, which basically uh, points to the fact that they get tired 
so tired of living on earth, they actually get sick of the process of breathing the air and eating the same food on earth for thousands of years. It actually starts to sicken them and only immortals get this. And they want to find ways to move beyond earth. Just because you live for thousands of years, that doesn't mean you get any special powers. Immortals, however, will learn if they focus in the right way, they will develop mystical and spiritual abilities over time. Most of the books are tablets that we have written are techniques that are used by mortals and highly evolved beings to rid themselves of humanity and to evolve. So the people that follow us on our Tybro site, www.tybro.com, you have access to materials that are normally only given to immortals and highly evolved beings. Yes, they're expensive, but there are things that you can't get anywhere else. Humans that have developed the light body um, have prepared a healthy body of light. They will transition themselves into this body in their consciousness at the point of death, which means that their physical body may die, but they have a vessel, a consciousness vessel waiting for them at the point of death. Some of them will also dissolve the body at that time. Others will simply aban abandon their physical body and download their consciousness into their mortal body of light. We, in the book, The Human Body of Light, in Ars Immortalis, and some of the other books that we've written, we've given explicit instructions on how to do this. My wife and I have prepared bodies uh, like this. We visit people in dreams in our body of light. Uh, some people of you, some of you have seen our bodies of light in the clouds and in your meditations. Those are real bodies. The human body, once it dies, if it's not immortal, will decay. And in some cases, if you've developed a body of light, your body will just shrink and disappear and just leave wrinkles like what you see on the screen up there. Those little bitty brown or a kind of mauve purple looking uh, balls are the remains of a person who has transformed their body from the physical tissue of the body into the immortal tissue of the body. And those tissues are called ring souls. That's the actual remains of that person. Now, a ring soul isn't just a hard looking rock. A ring soul can grow in size, it can divide in size, it can multiply, it's a living thing. And it can do that because it's still connected to the immortal being, to that person's body of light in higher dimensions. And as long as that person connects with their ring soul, they will continue to affect the ring soul's reality in this world. In the first hour, the light body will travel into higher dimensions of reality by itself. It will do that automatically. The specific dimension that it goes to it depends on the amount of light energy and what you've done with your body of light. As we said, Ars Immortalis and a number of our other books show you specifically how to create this. And those, these techniques do work. You can absorb light energy from the sun and it helps you create a body of light that works, that can help you avoid your body. Your physical body may die, but your consciousness can transfer directly into your body of light. And it is just a beautiful process to see. Now, after we do these couple of gray slides, we'll take a few more questions because I see they're starting to stack up and that's okay, that's what it's for. This is our first webinar and this is a way that we can communicate and have seminars and interact with you. And so if you have any questions, put them on your board there and I will get to them. Some humans have developed a relationship with a higher dimensional being, an angel or a God or higher elementals, even demons, and they'll be transported into that dimension of the higher being, depending on what that dimension is. If you work for the gods, we work for the gods, they will take your soul after your soul leaves your body and you will be guaranteed passage into a higher world. If you work for higher elementals and the angels, they will take your soul and work and you will get, be transported in a higher dimension. Now, what does it mean to work for the gods? Well, you know if you work for the gods or not. If you follow the will of the gods, if you follow the commands of higher beings, if you have them on, on your altar, if you pray to them, then they recognize you as a being that works for them. Most humans work for themselves. They don't recognize higher authority. They don't recognize higher beings. So at the moment of your death, you're on your own. There's nobody there to meet you. When humans have made offerings to and developed a working relationship with an entity, this entity will rec rescue that soul from the cycle of reincarnation simply because they like you. They want to work with you. 
They want to help you. The energy that results between a body and a higher entity may cause the body to show signs of grace. And people have heard about these signs of grace. There is lack of decay. There is a scented fragrance on the body. The body may emit light. And you, we've heard about a lot of these different things happening. The body may have a supple skin even after decades of the person having left the body. The body may be rosy in color. And there may be other miraculous events. All of these are caused by contact with higher dimensions of reality with this person. So let's take a few more questions. Uh, Craig, I see your question. Are we all still trapped inside the dome after death? If so, how do we leave after death? Death, and a lot of people are curious about that. The dome is the dome of reality that we live in. We live on an earth that is flat and we're all covered and protected by a dome. Death is part of the program. This reality is a large holographic program that is in part a huge matrix of subroutines that is running that we call our lives. Death is part of one of those programs. What we're doing with this is showing you how to get around what happens in death and how to navigate the program. Karen, how do you know if you're an immortal? Are there characteristics to look for? Well, that's a very good question. Some people are immortal, that are immortal, never get sick. They never develop any kind of disease and they don't age. They get to a certain age and they just stop aging. Also, they don't get broken bones. They don't get cavities. Uh, their hair never turns gray. They just don't age in the way that other people. Also at night, um, their eyes will tend to glow a little bit in the dark. So if that helps you a little bit, that's good. Hey, Father, this is an anonymous viewer. Since there are certain plans in place to limit the population and those that are doing well, is there anything we can do or should do besides elevating our consciousness? Good question. We have to learn to protect ourselves. We have to learn to take control of the reality of our program. We have placed a lot of tools out there for people to use to be able to help themselves. A lot of people look at the tools, they don't use them, they don't buy them. Those tools are in place for a reason. Go to our website at www.tybro.com, find a tool that you can use and start working on the reality that exists around you. The powers that be know that this is a program. They know that this reality is something that can be manipulated. If we learn to manipulate our reality and protect ourselves, we won't be at the mercy of those that know a little bit more about the program than we do. We don't have an excuse if we have the tools and don't use them. We'll take one more question. Michael, do you teach us how to create our life bodies in the Living Soul course? Um, to a certain extent, yes, we do. Um, but the Ars Immortalis is another book that you can use, the Human Body of Light and the Living Soul course are all things that you can use to help create your body of light. Okay, that's enough questions for now. We'll have one more round of questions before we stop. Let's go to the next slide. Now, if you're a normal human, and these are people that are defined by highly repressed immortality genes, which means they age at a normal rate, they have no significant working relationship with higher beings, and they have no significant body of life development. These are folks that are normal folks going through their lives with no significant spiritual relationships with any beings out there. And this is what's going to happen to them in the first hour. They're going to see a bright light. Some will see a bright light leading to the higher astral worlds. Some will see a dark tunnel leading to the lower astral world. That's not cool. That's probably about 30, 40% of the people listening. They're going to see a dark tunnel leading into the lower astral world. There are some people who see a world that looks pretty much as it was while they were in the body, and they're going to not see any transitional tunnel. And some will see an intermediate zone populated by beings of different ages, sex, and races. So about 20, 20 to 30 percent of you will see a bright light. About another 30, 40 percent of you will see a dark tunnel. And the rest of you are going to be evenly split between kind of seeing the world exactly as it is or a sort of intermediate stage uh, of world of different time periods of different ages. And you kind of, kind of be trapped in one of those intermediate zones. 
And that's most people. It's either going to be a dark tunnel or a light tunnel or some variation thereof. If the body is not created or cremated, and that's most people, a number of forces are going to act on your body. In this slide, you see a body lying in state. And for most people that are not cremated, this is what's going to happen to you. Your body's going to lie there. Lifeless is not going to be able to move. Some people, when they leave, when they leave their body and they pass, they get infatuated with trying to make the body come back. That's not going to happen. You're not going to be able to make your body breathe. You're not going to be able to make it move. Uh, you're not going to be able to make it sit up. But some people spend hours, if not days, trying to make their body move because they're accustomed to moving inside their body. But unfortunately, you are now a dead person. Not going to happen. Nothing's going to move. Your body's going to start to emit gases. Anybody that's worked around bodies will testify to the fact that the body gives off gases, a lot of gases. That's because of the bacteria that are acting on the body. In the absence of living metabolism, bacteria start to take over. Um, the body starts giving off negative energy. Thoughts, emotions, uh, energies that are stored in the body start to come off the body at that time. The body starts to pollute the atmosphere. If you go into a room where a dead body has not been moved, you know that a dead body is in that room because it starts to pollute the atmosphere. Also, parts of the subtle body are distressed inside the body. They haven't freed themselves yet. That part called the tamuz, T-A-M-M-U-Z, is still inside the body. There's also a black smoke that is emitted by the body caused by ghosts and negative entities that are trapped inside the bodies. They don't want to stay inside the body if they can't feed on it, so they start to find a way to get out of it. And ghosts take over the five bodies that we talked about, the subtle form, the physical energies, the supercausal, the causal, the mental energies, they take over all those bodies and try to feed on it and take over that person as much as possible. So those are the forces that act on the body. And this is some, a slide you probably want to go over after the talk is over. Ghosts act to try to pull the subtle body down into the astral world. In other words, these ghosts and negative attaching entities want to pull you as deeply into the negative worlds as possible they will cause the spread of very dark energy all over your body. So they will want you as much as possible to go into the lower astral worlds and not go into the higher astral worlds. They will try to pull your body into a dark place. Unfortunately, some of the ghosts pulling on your body are your ancestors. You might say, well, why would my ancestors want to pull me into a negative world? Because some of your ancestors don't like you. Some of your ancestors molested you. There are people in your ancestry that killed you, and they want you to be with them. Those are the beings that you want to be protected from by doing some of the things we're going to recommend. If the body doesn't receive the proper sacraments, if it's, for instance, doesn't get, doesn't get buried, if it's murdered and left in a field or a ditch, but doesn't receive the right prayers or protection, your subtle body will be pulled into the lower astral world. And in that case, the body will need protection. Funerals were designed because people over time recognized this fact and they recognized that something needed to be done when a person died to protect them from going into the lower astral world. If you don't have a funeral for a person or some kind of service, that person will usually be affected by lower entities and they will come back to the physical world and say, why didn't you give me a funeral? They'll haunt your dream. They'll haunt your homes. That's where negative entities and people tend to come from. If the body, though, receives the right sacraments, if it receives a funeral, some sort of ceremony, and if it also receives prayers from the divine world, which are some of the prayers we've recorded for you, the divine world prayer, the miracle prayer, um, the Usnisa Bajaya Dharani, all of those prayers you can find on our website, uh, tybro.com. You can go to the audio downloads. You can find the miracle prayer in several forms. You can find the uh, Usnisa Vijaya Dharani, which is a uh, divine world prayer. You can also find the Amatsunuri Goto. 
all prayers that can help give energy to the body and help the subtle body lift from the carcass or the corpse and the dead body and then move into a higher world. These prayers emit divine particles of energy that flood the body with golden light and help lift and elevate your soul into higher worlds. That's why they're called divine world prayers. Saying those prayers for yourself before you go to sleep or playing it at night and slowly in the background at a very low level can elevate the level of your sleep and help you elevate and go into higher worlds as you sleep. That's why they're called divine world prayers. You can see in this slide, it, the prayers emit this golden light, these golden particles that act on your souls. And if you play it while you're alive, it gets your soul used to being in a higher state. And so when you pass from the body, even without the divine world work, <coughs> you will elevate into a higher state. Go to our website at tybro.com. Look, <coughs> look under divine world prayers and you will see them and they will help you. The lower worlds and the place of the shadow sun. We talked quite a bit about the lower worlds. Let's look at the lower worlds and what they are and what the shadow sun is. The lower worlds are populated by souls that are heavily influenced by negative emotion, fear, anxiety, doubt, and worry. These souls believe in a better afterlife, but they don't trust the creator. They believe that they deserve some sort of life in a place called the Shadowlands. And that's what the lower worlds look like. You don't see the sunlight very often. It's often cloudy and there's not much furniture or housing or roads and you almost never see any sign of advanced civilization. It's just a big wide open kind of dark and shadowy place. Research in the near-death experiences revealed that almost half the people who remember their experience, their near-death experience, will have some recall of being in the Shadowlands. If you look at this image, you see this, this is as bright as it gets in the Shadowlands. This is a bright sunny day in the Shadowlands. In that world, it's often overcast. If the sun comes through, it comes through in very sparse areas and very small areas, and you just don't get much sunlight. That's what the Shadowlands look like. So let's look at the lands of reality. We'll take a, do a few more slides, and then we'll take two or three more questions, because I see they're starting to pile up again, and that's okay. That's what we're here for. Understanding that in the afterlife, it requires you to understand a layout of where we are in the universe. Most people never get a full idea of where we are and how we fit into the universe. We know that the physical world is our home, but where are the other places that are not physical? If you look at this image, this diagram, you see this black circle that I'm outlining here, right in the very middle? That's a representation of this, in this diagram of the physical world. Let's look at this black circle for a moment. In this black circle, most humans believe that the physical world is their true home. This is where we work, sleep, eat, make families, build lives, and then we die in the physical world. As you can see, the physical world is connected to many other places. This diagram gives you a, a really good sort of outline of the planes of reality or the lands of reality that li we live in. If you look at this mauve pattern, this pattern right here that looks like the cogs on a wheel, the one that I'm outlining here, and you might wanna go back over this when you look at the talk again. This is the place where we dream. And this dream place is one of the places that interpenetrates the physical world. It's a part of a number of worlds, including the physical world. The physical world is also part of the dream world. We go here every night and we did an entire seminar called Somnium, which goes into this in very deep detail. We have a book called Somnium, which you can find on our website. It's an excellent summary on sleep and dream magic. We go to this place every night. We have families there, we go to school there, and we have lives there, probably even more detailed than the lives we have here. And this is the world of somnium, or the dreaming, as it's also called. This blue pattern 
here that overlays the dream pattern is called the borderlands. And this part is a part of all the known worlds. It interpenetrates everything. As you can see, there's a lot of interpenetration between all the lands of reality. The borderlands are part of the dream, they're part of the physical world, they're part of the astral world, and they're part of the imagination. The imagination is a real place. Don't get it twisted. If you can think of something and imagine it, you're actually seeing something that is real. You may not be able to touch it physically, but it actually exists in a place. This is a home of fairies and elementals, dragons, divae. Some immortal humans have figured out how to move into the borderlands and many other beings. The borderlands exist between the physical world and the world of your imagination. That's the best way to look at it. The shadow lands, this black square here, this big black square, is where all things originate from. There are places in the shadow lands that don't exist in the physical world. They don't exist in dreams. They don't exist in the borderlands. This is a place where you find copies of everything that is going to exist that's waiting to manifest. We draw everything from this place. If you look at this little area up here in the corner, see this little area with this arrows wiggling here? This is an area, the, uh, the unmanifest area of the Shadowlands. It's where your imagination goes to draw things. Also this unmanifest area here. This green area is called the soft places. The soft places exist everywhere. There are some buildings, there are some fields, there are some spiritual places and temples um, that allow access to other worlds. It's also known as the next door backstage. There's a wonderful new series coming on uh, television uh, called The American Gods. And in The American Gods show, written by Neil Gaiman, they talk and use the Saw Places extensively. It's a brilliantly written uh, TV show called American Gods. You can find it I believe it's on Netflix. It's also a place where the gods used to physically walk into the afterlife and other worlds without having to go through the transition of death. Last place we're gonna to point to is the astral plane. It's this oblong green square. It's home to human spirits, our ancestors, um, demons, angels, elementals, aliens. It's also the main repository of everything that we know and everything we've remembered. So where are you gonna wake up? Well, 55% of the time, most humans die in a dream. That's a reality. 30% of the time, humans are gonna wake up in the astral plane. When you die in a dream, you wake up in the dreaming. So that's where most people tend to wake up. 5% of people are gonna become attaching spirits and wake up on the physical plane and remain attached there. In the shadow lands, some people are gonna wake up there. In other planes of reality, that's 5% or less. But if you look at the dreaming and the astral plane, that's 85 to 90% of where most of us are going to wake up, in a dream or somewhere on the astral plane. Okay, let's take a few questions. It's 10 till, so we're moving pretty well. Okay, Shelby, I see your question. If we have a few gods on your altar, how do you know which one you honor or upon your death? This, it's a very good question. The God that you work with the most, the God that you pray to the most, the God that you have the closest affiliation with, a God that you carry with you, a God that you have a close emotional tie to. If you don't have an emotional tie to a God, that's a God that is not going to be able to honor you. So pick one particular entity, develop a close emotional tie, and let that being be someone that you, that you ask to come be with you and take you to the other side. Uh, Dorothy's question, who are the people that are born with the veil covering their face? Those are the people that have a special ability to see um, life between the different dimensions that we just talked about. Crystal, I think I'll take a couple of your questions. You got four here, so let's see. If we're on a ship and nothing is really real, where do we really go when we die if we're still on a ship? Well, Crystal, we are on a ship, but death is part of the program on the ship. So we really go to another part of the program. It's an excellent question. Let's take number three here. How, to tell, how do you tell someone is really making contact with a loved one from the other side versus a lower entity? That is an excellent question. 
You all have sent in some really good questions. You have to test that entity. A lot of entities will pretend to be someone you know, a loved one, and they'll try to take energy from you. 99% of the time when an entity comes to you from the other side is somebody pretending to be a loved one. They will have met somebody that knows you and they want to, and if they have the energy and knowledge to come to you like that, they're going to try to take energy and power from you. Last one, what can you do? Let's see. Is there a time limit? This is all set's question. Is there a time limit in sending items to the spirit world after a soul makes its transition? Not really. You can send stuff to a spirit as long as that person is alive. It doesn't really matter how long that person stays around. You can send energy to that person forever. Even after that person's reincarnated, their astral form will stay in the astral world or the dreaming sometimes for decades after they've reincarnated. Eventually, it will go through a second death, pass on, and that person will be freed of that incarnation. When a person wakes up in the next world, they're often cold and hungry. Uh, most humans die in the dreaming, but they don't realize they've transitioned. In order for a human to move on to the next world, they must pray for some sort of release. And a divine world prayer is probably the best way to do that. The Amatsu Norigoto, the Usnisa Vijaya Dharani, and the Anabakor, the Lord's Prayer, are divine world prayers. These prayers have tremendous divine power and are capable of piercing the veil between worlds. In this way, a soul can be rescued by higher beings. So if a person passes and you want to do something for them, the best thing you can do is light a candle, say or pray the, the Amatsu Norigoto, or the Nisa Vijaya Dharana or the Anabakor, say that prayer immediately for them seven times. That person will see that light. It'll look like a bright, diffuse light, and it'll guide them toward a better world. Once the soul has transitioned to a higher world, it can receive medical attention. It can get food and water and rest. Um, the soul will not have any money. It won't have a home. It won't have any means of supporting itself because, again, most people haven't spent the time to try to prepare something for themselves. And this is where offerings from family and food and friends will help tremendously. It's also where the, the technique of the weight comes from. In many cultures, in many countries, there'll be a period of time where people will bring a lot of food to the family and people have just reasoned that, well, it's because they don't want the family to have to cook. It's not the real reason. The real reason is they want the, the deceased person to have food and other things that they might need immediately after transitioning so they won't be hungry. The mistake people make is they stop bringing food. They stop putting food out for the person. Because of this, there's a debt that builds up, and that debt is called the tribulus. The tribulus is a debt that most humans ignore. This debt is the amount of money and wealth that we could use to help ourselves and or others, but we choose not to do that. We choose not to give away 10%. We choose not to acquire spiritual tools. We choose not to evolve ourselves. We, we develop a debt. There are demons and lower entities that collect this debt if our descendants don't make offerings of money and food on our behalf. In many cultures, they will make offerings at people's graveside. They will make offerings at the time of their death. We don't do that in the Western culture. These entities, when they get on the other side, will give humans shelter. They'll give them food. They'll give them clothing. And they'll give them money in exchange for labor. This labor usually consists of torturing, tempting, and abusing other life forms, including people. We wrote about this ex extensively in a book called The Black Tablet or Demonium Tablet. These demons will pay humans, we'll take care of you, we'll give you a place to live, give you some food, but you gotta go torture this guy and you gotta go torture this woman, you gotta do it till I say stop. That's where that sort of debt, that tribulus comes from. The tribulus exists because, uh, stop. Ghosts like to place black energy in our food, they like to place it in our drink and in our physical tissues. This is called detritus, and we've talked about detritus before. Usually they're under the uh, guidance of demons or negative entities, and they're told where to put the detritus, 
what kind of detritus to put in a person and how much to put there. The main purpose of their energy, this energy is to turn off your immortal genes. It blocks light from the higher entities and creators and it prevents the soul from accelerating and growing. As you can see, they aim for the heart and different areas in the body. And these entities are given a, a good supply of this dark detritus energy. They place it in our food, they place it in our water, they place it in animals, so that people who are in the world that don't know about detritus, over time get filled with this stuff. And we've talked about different uh, types of detritus and where you can get it from. Let's talk about a way to remove detritus that we're gonna give you for free. This is a way that you can remove ghost detritus. Take the time to look at this letter A. Runes are magical entities that come from a different sphere of consciousness. This letter A right here that I'm pointing to, I want you to take one cup of rock salt and a bucket of water, any type of bucket will do, it doesn't matter if it's plastic or metal, and write the rune letter for A in a piece of white paper. Burn it, place the ashes in the water along with the rock salt. Place your feet in the water for 15 minutes. And I would suggest doing this about once a month. I wrote about doing this in a book called The First Darkness. Great book. I love that book. But it's also useful for protecting you from ghost detritus. The detritus will go into the water. The letter A will help stop you from um, accumulating it. And then when, once you're done keeping your feet in the water for 15 minutes, throw the water away. Just throw it into uh, the commode. Throw it, into, throw it out onto the uh, soil. And it just doesn't matter where you put it. So this is a way that you can dissolve the ghost detritus as it builds up over time. Many humans will reincarnate in order to escape tribulus. They know that they have debt on the other side and they wanna keep that debt going. Uh, so they'll follow themselves into the physical world just to escape that debt. It's one reason why people are born poor. It's one reason why people are born in very bad parts of the world because they're trying to escape the astral debt or tribulus in other dimensions. Also, a lot of people, once they pass, families will abandon their homes. They'll abandon their cars if they don't work. They'll abandon bills they have. They'll abandon furniture. And all these things be feed the tribulus because somebody will eventually have to tear down that house. They'll have to do something with the car. And if these bills aren't handled, uh, the tribulus is accrued over time. And there's a lot of abandoned homes, abandoned cars, abandoned furniture, abandoned buildings that accumulate tribulus both in this world and in the next world. How do you help stop from accumulating this? We're gonna give you a couple things you can do. You can establish a relationship with a higher being. You can make offerings, have an altar. We have a book on altars that you can go to our website and look up. You also can help um, establish a relationship with a higher being and ask them to help you with this debt. Take care of your stuff. Take care of your home. Be responsible with the things that you have in the world. Make plans for your stuff. If you don't make plans for your stuff, your family's going to fight over it. Ghosts and demons are going to make sure that families fight over it. It's one of the worst times in the world for families. If there's anything worth fighting over, you can be sure that families are going to fight over it. Make offerings for your ancestors. Send them money. Send them food. Send them some type of support. And you can go on uh, eBay and many other websites and find ancestor money. It's also called Joss money or hell notes and burn it regular for your ancestors. They get the energy of this money and it helps them a lot. We have a product called the Elysium generator that is a new product. Never been offered before, but after, I, after we talked about after and we did this seminar, I realized people can be lazy and they just don't like to do certain things to help themselves. This is a product that is a revolution in ancestor and personal offerings. The Elysium fields are the main resting place for our ancestors and our subtle bodies. It takes different forms in different cultures, but it's in general called the Elysium fields. When you make an offering, that's where it goes. This product radiates money, food and helpers into the astral worlds or the Elysium fields. You don't have to do anything but place this product on your altar. 
focus on something that you need while looking at it, at the radiator, and it will be there waiting for you in the Elysium field. So it can actually take the place of doing regular um, ancestor offering. You just put it on your altar and it'll send the energy out there for them. Also, it's key directly to the astral world and it comes in different sizes. Each size radiates larger and larger amounts of energy, food, money, and support for you and your ancestors. There's a Shapti function. In ancient Egypt and other cultures, they would send actual people that would be buried with you to serve you. Now, we don't have to do that anymore. We can put uh, certain spiritual um, helpers. We put certain spiritual helpers energy in the radiator and it provides you with helpers that will aid you with the needs in your afterlife. Basically, they will serve you. That's what they exist for. They're not slaves. They gladly serve those who have this Shopty function in the generator. So if you go to www.tybro, look under radiators, you'll see the Elysium radiator listed there. It does the work of sending offerings, money, food, energy, and helpers into the astral world for you. So we'll take two questions and we'll end part one right here. Let's see here. And in part two, we're gonna go into a lot more detail about the afterlife and what happens there. What are some of the places we can go? Let's see, Thomas, does the phase not, not can, not cannot, let's see. I can't understand that. We'll go to the next one. When someone we love dies and we see signs of them after, like broad lights or their voices, is this them coming from us or from a loved one? Yes, that's them coming back to say hello. Usually the bright lights and voices are all they can do to communicate with us. For those of us who are divine conscious souls, what will we see when we die if we're not created a body of light? Divine conscious souls are chosen by the gods to go directly into a higher world. Your soul will be picked up and carried directly into a higher world. Um, the divinity, of your, divinity in your soul was recognized to be a very high level of divinity because you were able to make the sun blink or multiply in the sky. That's a hard thing to do. The gods recognize that and you have a special place with the gods. A number of gods will reach your soul at the moment of your death and you will go into a higher world. Would it be better to work on, Im on immortality or body of light? Being conscious of immortality or being conscious of a body of light is something that you can do as something that will help you. Uh, working with the Ars Immortalis or the Demonium tablet or one of the other tablets will help you become a more evolved being. If you don't work on those things, you'll go into a higher world, but you'll be like a baby. You won't know anything. You won't know any of the principles of living there and you'll have to be taught and usually it'll take very, a number of lifetimes before you can work on something to be able to use that energy. So we'll stop right here and we wanna thank everyone for coming with us. We're gonna have the next part of this uh, in a few weeks and we wanna thank everybody for joining us with this part of our first webinar on after, after part two will be in a few weeks. Thank you for joining us.